grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, three little words that will change your life forever and for better. Here I am. When God calls, the proper response of the people of God is, Here I am. And I will just tell you that these three words were spoken as an example for us at different times by some of the real heroes of Israel. When God called out to Abraham on that day when his faith would be the most severely tested, Abraham responded, here I am. And when God called out to Jacob in a night vision, Jacob also responded, here I am. Centuries later, when young Samuel, that prophet-to-be, was asleep in the temple and God calls his name, Samuel says, here I am. And when the voice of God cried out, whom shall I send? The prophet Isaiah raises his hand and says, here am I, send me. And so, of course, in our first reading today, it's Moses who replies from God's call from the bush, and Moses says, here I am. And as wonderful and as powerful as those here I am's are, they are by no means the most important here I am. You know, the life satisfaction and the fulfillment that comes to us when we raise our hand and we say, Here I am, Lord, send me. That's great. But that is also not the most important here I am that we will ever hear in Scripture. The most important here I am comes late in the book of Isaiah. And we'll get to that soon enough. But first, let's just consider for a minute how God calls Moses in today's first reading. You know, that first part of the reading is from the very first chapter of Exodus and kind of sets the stage for what happens next. Um, and if you know the story, the 12 tribes of Israel living in Egypt since the time of Joseph have flourished. Joseph has been known and trusted by Pharaoh, and the Israelites have been given some of the best land in all of Egypt <coughs> to settle in. And if you know your Bible, you know that God had promised Abraham three things, descendants, blessing, and land. And at this point of the story, two of those three blessings have already, or two of those Three promises, I should say, have already been fulfilled. The Israelites have been blessed during their time in Egypt because Pharaoh knew, Pharaoh knew them and he, and, and he trusted Joseph. And God just blessed them while they were in the land of Goshen. They were strangers in the land, but because Pharaoh trusted Joseph, Pharaoh gave these Israelites a place to settle. And it just happened to be some of the best land in the country. And the people thrived there. So the promise of blessing had been fulfilled. Pharaoh approved of and God blessed Israel settling in Goshen. And so the 12 tribes of Israel started to grow. By the time of our reading, their numbers had grown to the point where they were seen as a threat by the new Pharaoh. And how's Egypt respond then? They respond by enslaving the Israelites and even by uh, putting out an order to kill off all the newborn male babies. 
But thanks to God's protection, the Israelite, Israelite numbers continued to grow. They were thriving even though they were in bondage. And so this promise of descendants was a reality. And so the stage is now set for the fulfillment of that third promise, the promise of a land that Israel could call its own. Just one little problem. They were being held captive as slaves by the superpower of the time. They needed a liberator. They needed someone uniquely qualified to lead them out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. And so enter Moses. God was about to raise up a leader who had those unique qualifications. As a newborn, Moses had, through the power of God's grace, survived that Egyptian order to kill off all the male children. His mother placed him in a basket as a newborn and floated him down the River Nile. And Pharaoh's daughter had found the baby floating in the basket and taken him to be her own son. And so Moses was raised in Pharaoh's court, and so he knew how royalty in Egypt thought and how they acted. But he also knew his Hebrew roots. After Moses had grown up, he saw a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian overlord. And so Moses steps in and he strikes the Egyptian, killing him. The fact that he had been raised in Pharaoh's house wouldn't save his life, so he had to flee. He had to run for his life. And where does he flee? Out into the wilderness. He becomes a shepherd in the land of Midian. And there he took a wife, and he learned all about how to survive in the wilderness. That might come in handy later on, right? And this is exactly where we are in the second part of our reading. And just for the record, just let me say that for us today, we have eyes to see it. This reading has some profound implications. <coughs> so here's the story. Here's the way it sets up. Moses is just sort of minding his own business. Out in the desert, standing, tending sheep. He's in the desert of Midian, when off in the distance he sees something a little peculiar. A bush is on fire. But the fire doesn't seem to be spreading. But neither does the bush seem to be consumed as the fire burns on and on. And Moses is curious about that. He decides it's worth a look. He says to himself, and our text says this, he says, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. It's the next line that I think is so amazing. And I think it's amazing because it applies to us today. And, and it might seem a little strange, but it says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Makes you wonder a little bit, doesn't it? How many other people had walked by the bush and never even bothered to go take a look at it? I mean, maybe, maybe they just were tired. Maybe they were busy. Or maybe they just didn't care. But when Moses shows just a little bit of curiosity, just the tiniest bit of interest, God calls out to him, Moses, Moses. And Moses utters those three fateful words. Here I am. And I would just tell you the way that this applies to us today is very simple. All it takes from us is just a little bit of spiritual curiosity for God to act. 
Jesus says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. All it takes is a little curiosity to start that spiritual journey of a lifetime. And did you know, did you notice that in this story, that spiritual journey of a lifetime starts with baby steps? In our reading today, God doesn't overwhelm Moses with, with, with some uh, huge, I don't know, display of power. There's no booming thunder or crashing lightning. There's no fire and brimstone raining down from heaven. Just a little bush off in the desert that burns for a bit. God eases into his relationship with Moses and with us. Make no mistake, the major miracles come. Moses is going to be involved in turning the Nile to blood and the parting of the Red Sea. But for now, a burning bush in the desert <coughs> is all it takes to start that journey. God takes some time and allowing Moses to get to know him. They converse for a bit. And the Lord gives Moses a God job. You did catch that, didn't you? And, and to say that Moses didn't quite feel up to the task would be a huge understatement. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He can't believe God's calling him to do this thing. But then God promises to be with him. They talk a little bit more, and then God gives Moses more opportunities to get to know him. And finally, finally, God does something for Moses that he had never done for anybody else in history. God takes the time to give Moses God's personal name. After all, you can't have a personal relationship with someone if you don't know his name, right? And as a matter of fact, in that reading, that we were given three different names that God uses. And God gives them himself. In just two verses, God refers to himself in three different ways. And in the Hebrew language, all the names carry weight. They're significant. <coughs> There's something important about them. When God tells Moses he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he uses the word Elohim. This is the transcendent creator God, the God of the universe from Genesis chapter 1. Elohim is God Almighty, the God of all the omni words, omniscient, all knowing, omnipresent, he's everywhere. Omnipotent, he's all powerful. But in the very same breath, God tells Moses he's also the God of the living, the God of the present. He tells Moses, I am right now who I am. Tell the Israelites that I am has said you if they asked. And in Hebrew, that's Hayah. Asher Hayah. And when Jesus picks up this same language, when he gives those famous I am statements, especially in John's Gospel, in the Greek it's ego ami. I am. And in all these cases, I am is God of the present, God of the living, God with us right now. But I would tell you that it's the third name of God that's the real groundbreaker in this whole conversation. For the first time in history, God gives a human being God's personal name to use. Verse 15 is where it comes. In verse 15, God tells Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord, 
And there it is. That's the word. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. And he finishes that off by saying, This is my name forever, by which I will be remembered from generation to generation. The Lord. That's how it's translated in English in our Bibles. And just to let you know that it's this personal name of God, whenever we read it, the Lord is in all caps. It's God's personal name. And you know, in the ancient Hebrew, when it was written, the Hebrew didn't have vowels. So this personal name of God was represented by just four letters. Y-H-W-H. -H. Now we use vowels in English. Can you figure out where this Y-H-W-H gets us? Yahweh. Yahweh. But for the Hebrews, this personal name that God gave Moses was so sacred that they didn't even want to utter it out loud. The four letters YHWH could be written down, but it couldn't be vocalized. And rather than refer, refer to God's name out loud, they came up with another name that again in English we translate it as the Lord, but when you read the Lord in the Bible, it's with just a capital L and then small lower, lowercase letters for the rest. The Hebrew word was Adonai, and it means Lord. And it's used for people, but it's also used in Psalms and in Ecclesiastes and in other places to refer to God. Okay, so why go through all this Hebrew stuff? I told you all of that to tell you this. And I guess this is what I would say is your takeaway for the day. From the very beginning, God wanted a personal relationship with the humans that he created in his own image. Before our collective fall from grace, God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He had revealed himself to Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and others. And finally, when he gets around to talking to Moses, he gives Moses his personal name that he's to use forever after that. God talks to Moses face to face. And all it took to start that relationship with Moses was just a little bit of spiritual curiosity. And as important as those characteristics that Moses had as, as to knowing how Pharaoh's court worked and, and all his wilderness training, maybe the thing that God most admired about Moses was that Moses was open to seeing God. He was willing and able to turn away from his everyday duties long enough to investigate something spiritual. And it's funny, our text tells us that God notices that. And he engaged Moses, and he starts that engagement with baby steps. He didn't overwhelm Moses, but he did give him a God job. And he promised to be with him the whole time that he was accomplishing it. It is the same today with us and our loved ones. If we are the tiniest bit spiritually curious, it gets noticed by God. If we can break away, even for a little bit, from our daily routines, even for a short time to investigate the divine, we open ourselves up To hear God's call. And so very often when we do that, God engages us with baby steps. He doesn't overwhelm us. I told you before how in my own faith story, after I had fallen away from faith for 12 years and slowly but surely started to come back to faith, 
the God job that I was qualified to do back in my old church in the Bay Area was to iron and hang banners in the sanctuary. That's what I was spiritually qualified to do. That was the baby step that God took with me. So God provokes Moses' spiritual curiosity, not with some grand display, but with just a small burning bush in the desert. And I would say there's a lesson there for us also. We all have friends and loved ones that we would love to see come to faith. But let's not try to overwhelm them with some kind of mega witness or super evangelism. Sometimes that stuff does more harm than good. As Jesus says in our gospel lesson, God is the God of the living, all the living. Those who have come to faith and those who have not yet come to faith. God loves our friends and our relatives even more than we do. God wants them to come to faith even more than we do. The Bible tells us the Lord is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. When the time's right, God calls us by name, and if we show even the slightest bit of curiosity, He begins that relationship with us that changes our lives forever and for better. And then is when we receive the most important I am in the Bible. And as I said, it comes late in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 58 tells us, Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here I am. God is here for us. All it takes is a little curiosity on our part, a little bit of wanting to know more about God. And when we or our loved ones call, God says to us, here I am. Amen.